Uh, hi gamers, it is my pleasure to speak today with No Purpose Indie, also known as Ryan, who is a multimedia artist with a channel here on YouTube. Uh, I've seen some amazing Final Fantasy XIV content and I'd love to get to speak to him today, so let's talk about positivity in video games. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Um, I'm Ryan, uh, Ryan Riley, uh, No Purpose Indie. I do YouTube content. Uh, Instagram content, uh, pretty much putting up anything between uh, 3D animations, music videos, new player experiences, and just overall story narrative stuff uh, related to gaming. And uh, a game I love, Final Fantasy XIV. Awesome. Yeah, no, I've seen some amazing content. So I'm looking forward definitely to speaking with you today and seeing your perspective on these questions. Uh, so for anyone who may have already seen an episode of this podcast, it does follow a format. So the questions are going to be about the same. Um, but I am definitely looking forward to hearing the answers. Uh, can you tell us about your earliest memories playing video games? Yes. So I was a very early gamer. Um, my brother might have been about six or seven when he got a Sega and um, so technically I got the Sega too. Um, I remember we had Sonic the Hedgehog, Double Dragon, uh, I think a game called Wonder Boy um, and those were really super vibrant games, side-scrolling games. Uh, I wouldn't really say my mind was blown because that had happened so early. In life, it almost became supernatural. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I just, and like even earlier um, or later, um, I used to love the fighting fantasy books, you know, where it's like uh, you go into a dungeon and you see a cave. Do you go left or right? Oh, go yeah, left yeah. To, or turn to page 160 to turn left. And, mm -hmm. you know, I used to love those games and they actually kind of, created my love for branching stories and stories that give you options to become your own character and uh yeah so i'm a early gamer no that's fantastic so uh did you, was the sega kind of the the first one you had as a kid in and you had it for most of your childhood or did you get into nintendo in those early years as well or so i never got into nintendo there were occasions mm -hmm. there on where like the ds came out played that uh mm. 3ds came out i bought that because i thought technology was cool and the games were cool i think kingdom hearts uh had a sequel coming out and i was like well now i have to buy it <laughs> um uh, but start off with the sega genesis and then we moved on to playstation one i remember our first game being mickey mouse adventures and it was a very cool game a very difficult game i could only get past the f first couple levels but I was six, so um, I th think it's fair to say I wasn't a good gamer at that time. Um, but then uh, I went to America, and they already had Game Boy Colors, and my cousin uh, gave me his uh, Game Boy Color, so I got to play all the games like Pokemon and uh, mm -hmm. pretty much all these other games. And uh, but I'm primarily PlayStation. PlayStation is always the uh, kind of uh, brand I stuck with because it felt uh, felt good to play. Uh, There's a far bigger interest in story games. Um, you know the history of PlayStation games like mm. Spider Man, God of War, all these really uh, Last of Us, really big titles that were PlayStation exclusive for a long time. So I always kind of stuck on that end of the boat. Um, so we got our PS2 shortly after um after it came out maybe about a year after it came out i think the first two games we had was red faction and harry potter chamber of secrets which was a fantastic <laughs> game it was a really good game i was actually really scary as well so um uh but then something clicked like something had a proper change in my mindset once i played Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy X. Mm -hmm. I played them at the same time. And uh, yeah, it was like my mind just kind of opened to this whole new world of um, 
of beautiful art and color and extremely impressive and beautiful music and um, gameplay, which was just top notch. Um, so, and then of course, story. I got super into narrative games after playing those because it really just kind of opened the floodgates for what's possible in a video game. And video game storytelling has always been my favorite medium. Absolutely. If I were to name two transformational titles, those would definitely be it. Kingdom Hearts and Final Fantasy X. Absolutely. And I actually have um, the first tattoo oh, I wow. got. Um, was this one at the same time I got this one um, from Final Fantasy X. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's okay. the crest on um, yeah. Final Fantasy, or it's the, I called them Final Fantasy. Um, yeah, it's the crest that Tita wears on his chest. How have video games influenced your personal interests and hobbies? I mean, it, it's changed your skin, but what else about your life <laughs> has it changed? It certainly has. Um, so, yeah. Going from that, I definitely took a massive interest in art and music. Um, definitely, I wanted to be able to create something like what I just witnessed. You know, I was like, how can I possibly make something like this that might blow somebody's mind? Um, or how can I just make something that kind of adds to what I saw? You know, I didn't get mad into fan fiction but at the same time i did you know make my own board games for kingdom hearts i made uh, my own branching stories for uh final fantasy 10 um so i definitely took a more uh artistic creative focus from that um i because it was uh you know square enix and uh overseas japanese uh artistry that I just never saw in Ireland. Um, so I became a big fan of character, you know, creating characters and, um, you know, actually seeing the emotions and uh, how lifelike a character can actually be and how can they grow. And um, I was working in a trampoline factory at one point. Um, oh. And I was like, okay, well, now I need to pretty much do all the acrobatics that I've seen a ninja would do in Final Fantasy XIV. <laughs> you know, so I would try and copy all these really super anime um, backflips and try to see if I can do them. So yeah, there was kind of an influence um, on just being a bit more creative and kind of pushing um, myself to be able to do things I just didn't think I would be able to do. Anything I thought looked cool, I was like, yeah, I'm going to try and do that. <laughs> no, that that is awesome. Uh, have you ever learned any valuable life lessons from playing video games? And if so, um, could you share an example? There's always been a feeling of expression, trying to express yourself. Um, and I was always very different from people from uh, my location, everyone was super into football. Um, actually, yeah, it was a huge football um, uh, town. And if you weren't into football, then no point talking to you. Uh, and then people who did play games would usually only play Call of Duty or FIFA mm -hmm. and um, wouldn't hear about anything else. Um, but so that kind of gave me a push to express myself, kind of be who I want to be. If I want to dye my hair, go ahead and dye it. If I want to have a fringe, take it. Uh, also, just kind of from seeing so many, so many games that let you take so many different paths and the lives of these characters and their future is kind of in your hand. So definitely uh, kind of follow, trying to be a hero or just trying to be the good guy. I always just want to be a good, oh, hey, Katie. <laughs> uh, I've definitely had an interest in fashion. I wonder what kind of made me think about that. Definitely Final Fantasy mm. 14 with the glamour system. You always want your character to look badass and cool and you wish you could um, 
you wish you could get outfits like that and it would look just as cool on you um but valuable life lessons um yeah so one major thing is um to try and see things from the point of view of others because usually when you're kind of closed off and in your house and you're not talking to that many people you don't get really get to see other perspectives maybe um uh your town isn't as diverse with different cultures mm -hmm. so you'd never really know um what other people live like and i feel gaming is really a great opportunity to actually take yourself out of your skin and see what it's like for another person as long as the game is extremely well written or even well written enough and the characters feel believable then you can genuinely put yourself in their shoes and can of see what they see even just for a brief moment so whenever you know something happens in life i might get angry i might get confused or uh if i feel um hurt in any way i always now try to try and imagine what it's like from their point of view and just try and understand the person and why they would do certain things i think that's important because people can uh, close themselves off very quickly they can just see something they don't like and just go that person's crazy and just be labeled as crazy and won't think any more into it but mm -hmm. um i feel like that's a really valuable lesson i took from games is being able to take being able to actually think what somebody else might be going through yeah, no, that's a, a really valid point is it may even be the first time someone from a smaller community might see some of these perspectives or some of these options. And yeah, absolutely. Um, how have video games impacted your social life and relationships? So I've always been very sociable and um, I will go out and I'll happily chat to everyone. Um, part of my job is networking. So I, I, mm -hmm. I do have to go out there and swap business cards or well, people might mainly just use Instagram. Um, I think gaming very much lets me close off a lot quicker from people. And that can definitely be a good and bad thing. Um, certainly it's helped me um, anytime I'm going through a difficult time, it's definitely given me a leeway to kind of build myself back up and um, quiet the uh, thoughts that might be going on in your head. Um, but at the same time, I met a lot of amazing people who also love video games. And when you meet somebody who might play the same thing as you, went through the same journey, you automatically kind of feel connected because you both know you've been through something um been through similar experiences and when less and less people are gamers or uh you know you don't have that many people to talk to you even get a deeper connection from that person who can relate to you so it definitely is 50 50. i um certainly wouldn't change anything um to the average person they might think you know he's not going out every day and going to the bar and going to <laughs> football matches but yeah. like the truth is i just want to go on adventures and see what's new and um broaden my imagination and um also i just like being comfy at home <laughs> right? yeah you look, look forward to going home putting on the comfy pants and just enjoying a good story yeah yes absolutely and the cup of coffee as well mm. always important or tea <laughs> whatever you end with have you ever used skills or strategy learned from video games in real life situations? Absolutely. Um, there'd be a ton to pick from, but I've definitely seen this question when you sent them over. I was mm -hmm. like, I could talk for ages about this one. <laughs> um, I think one of the funniest ones was uh, before college, uh before i started going to college you know you had that summer you want to play a long game i was one of the few people who actually picked up a playstation vita and one of the best mm -hmm. games that was on the vita was um persona 4 golden um and persona is all about 
preparing your day as a school school normal school guy so then at night you can uh, raid dungeons and go into people's minds and kill their demons and all that um but what it actually kind of taught me was since i like to rush ahead and sometimes i get ahead of myself and want if i want to do something i want to do it all within a day um or i might want to do multiple things like play guitar or play games or write something or draw something it's like it's too much as uh, i can't pick what to decide but persona kind of restricts you to only ever doing one thing per day and that used to drive me insane like you could only go to the cinema to raise your stats or you can uh go meet one of your friends so you can build the relationship and then you earn the new skill um, so I kind of took from that um, to be patient, to dedicate yourself to one thing, make sure it's finished or just progress bit by bit and it'll eventually get done. Um, that sort of mindset really helped me out um, for just before college. But um, one thing that I think is very important, uh, one skill um, from video games that really helped me out was I have dyspraxia, so I have a uh, hard time with a bunch of different things. I trip up a lot. It's uh, um, the wires cross uh, when you try to speak. Um, there's a bunch of different uh, little problems that might not seem so apparent. So it used to be called uh, clumsy child syndrome um, because a person just kind of looks like a clumsy child. Um, but in reality, there actually is a, um, if you have an issue with reading and everything, I can read perfectly, but when it comes to novels, my mind just trips up. I forget why I read in the last sentence. If I get distracted, I have to read it and read it and read it about 10 times and it still won't go in. And that used to drive me insane because having to read books in school and after school um, was always something that people said you really need to start doing. But um, I just never liked reading novels because my mind just kept jumping all over. But when you play games like Final Fantasy VII, uh, everything only comes up in one line. Uh, mm -hmm. and one line and one line sometimes a paragraph and another paragraph and it's mainly just sectioned off into paragraphs and from that i learned to read quite well and gather stories quite well and um um just getting better at understanding and learning different uh words ideas um it definitely helped me when it came to script writing for films or animations because I would have it sectioned off in paragraphs, just like a game, so I can perfectly read it and be less stressed. I get my work done. So that was one of the uh, things that definitely really helped out um, that I learned from video games. And that's sure. really cool. Um, there was also um, that thing I touched on earlier uh, about branching narratives. Um, mm -hmm. One of the final projects we had to do in college was um one of the final things we had to do in college was uh we decided to create a live action uh branching narrative where it we were working with deaf people at the time and and hard of hearing people we were looking for a way to help hard of hearing uh people in society because uh, a few of us on the project have somebody related to us that does um that is deaf and uh you'd have to learn sign language we decided to create a branching narrative in live action that would uh teach emergency services how to appropriately deal with a deaf or hard of hearing person and we essentially filmed all these different scenarios of um, what could potentially go wrong, what issues you might create, and how to solve it. Um, and I would never have been able to actually create that branching narrative without having played um, any of these branching narrative games. It actually became incredibly 
natural to me when I started making it because I've seen it all done before. I've played Detroit Become Human. You know, I do actually <laughs> see how all these paths interweave with each other. And I came out great. So that I give that one to Galen for sure. Okay. That that is personally amazing. Like I I I majored in creative writing in university. Um, but never once have I have I looked at a video game and been like, oh yeah, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, no, that's phenomenal is being able to apply that to writing for sure. Absolutely. Um, how do you think video games have evolved over time and how has that impacted your experience with them? So from starting off on Sega, mm -hmm. I got to see the PlayStation 1, PlayStation 2, PlayStation Portable. I got to see um, how the graphics wars happened where um, game developers and companies were just challenging each other to reach the perfect graphical fidelity and prove that they're the best. And um, I got to see a kind of internet war go on or a, a business war going on several locations of, between PC, Xbox, and uh, everyone's just trying to adapt uh, and create uh, brand new experiences and new ideas and um, just kind of extend or exceed all limitations when it comes to building something artistic. Uh, the main thing is I got to see um, the art, the uh, games truly being developed uh, at an exceptional rate. Within 20 years, they went, or 20 or 30 years, they went from Pong only able to be a, only being able to have a couple squares at a time on screen, to now having massive games like uh, Baldur's Gate or mm -hmm. Assassin's Creed Odyssey, um, uh, which are just when you really look at it. Um, these are massive, massive open worlds that are at a scale that people would have never expected to be able to come out. Um, so I have, during that process of everyone trying to top each other and create the next best thing, I got to see all the limitations. You know, sometimes you can only have a memory card that has eight mm -hmm. megabytes of saved data yeah. or, um, you know, uh, you wouldn't be able to have more than a couple characters on that screen. Um, suddenly, games are getting more impressive and more impressive. Uh, but then around the PS4 era, we started noticing that uh, the games were starting to be underdeveloped or uh, the technology just wasn't there yet. So we had heavy load times. We had uh, big frame rate issues. Um, we could no longer have the same frame rate back and forth uh, between uh, 30 and 60. Um, I got to see just technology advance on a creative level um, from Sega to where we are now at like PlayStation 5 or GTX, whatever number. Mm -hmm. um, and it's there's only just so much more room to grow. Um, so as games and technology develops and uh, the games and stories get bigger, I feel like my mind and imagination and possibilities get bigger. And it's becoming so much easier to make a game uh, that people like you or me can honestly just pick up a free piece of software and uh, see uh, the huge amount of community support uh, that software might get and suddenly it just becomes easier to be a game developer and make these stories and work with others. Um, so yeah, definitely the potential for further growth is just constant. Um, especially when you look at games like Elden Ring. Mm -hmm. um, and like they could be better you know, they could always be better. Like uh, Elden Ring being an example was one of my favorite games of all time. Um, but at the same time, the remake of Demon's Souls came out and it was just tuned to perfection. 
uh, the graphics were unbelievable. Uh, it used all the PlayStation 5 features. Um, it ran so incredibly smoothly. The animations were fantastic. And all of that, despite Elden Ring being such an incredible work of art, um, and a fantastic game all around, we still saw from the Demon Souls remake how much better it could mm -hmm. still be eventually. Um, so yeah, that's um, I'm looking forward to just seeing what comes next. Oh, it's um, fantastic. Especially, especially, I'm sure you played Final Fantasy VII remake. Um, uh, yeah, I haven't. I haven't gotten through the whole thing yet. But yeah, so I won't. Go. I definitely won't spoil anything. Mm -hmm. But like, even just comparing the original. Yeah. To the remake the polygon yeah. figures versus the <laughs> realistic yeah 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 um and you know they work that into the story as well there's plenty of occasions where they show that time has passed that they are able to do a lot of things that they wouldn't have been able to do otherwise so it's really impressive so, I mean, you mentioned Baldur's Gate, and I would have asked if you hadn't brought it up, um, because it is kind of the most recent example of like a, a massive branching mm. storyline. Uh, how how does the person that you are who played Final Fantasy X, what do you think of that from a, you know, I got to grow up and see this as being an example of what it became? Um, and do you think that as we go into games like that, that we have to make sacrifices for story? Um, like a lot of triple uh, A gaming companies are talking about the time and effort that goes into a game like that yes. versus yeah, yeah, other yeah. games. Um, so may I just ask what the first part of that question was? Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, is kid you super excited? Like, have you played oh, yeah, Baldur's yeah, yeah, Gate yeah. and are you super excited Sorry. about seeing things like that? Um, absolutely. Because, um, Honestly, when I look at Baldur's Gate, what I really see is um, a game called Dragon Age Origins. Yes, um, yes, I love that yes. game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, which I absolutely loved. It was yeah. Mass Effect, but fantasy. And yeah. um, really incredible how branched out it could be. It could just go on and on and um, dramatically change the ending. And not just the ending, but the entire structure of the next game. And then the next game with Dragon Age 3 and the story just continued on and continued on no matter how varied your choices were. They worked it in and it was just insanely impressive. And um, Baldur's Gate has been a real uh, been a real treat big time because it's a massive nostalgia flashback to Dragon Age Origins. Um, but it's also just incredibly free and dense and your options are astronomical. And uh, it really is the closest thing I've ever seen to what you would kind of guess is a um, Dungeons and Dragons game. Mm -hmm. It's very, I mean, it is Dungeons and Dragons, but it's really the first time where, um, you know, if something crazy comes up and you'd be like, imagine if the game let me do this and then with Baldur's Gate the option will always come up if you want to kick a squirrel you can kick a squirrel but it might bite back it might turn into a human who knows what will happen and that's what I love about Baldur's Gate there's so much room for discovery and um, just actions having consequences sometimes you'll just pick the most the craziest option because you know the game will stop you. Be mm -hmm. like, oh, hey, you know, you can't actually do that. Yeah. You're actually a good guy. But <laughs> Baldur's Gate will let you do it. <laughs> um, and that level of freedom is something I really do hope we continue to see in games big time. Um, right. It doesn't suit every story. Absolutely. There's mm -hmm. so much room for a linear story, a more set focused, uh, big set piece of the story. Um, but just being able to see how free a game can be and that you can play it seamlessly with um, a co-op partner, split screen or online, it has easily the best co-op experience I've ever had in a game. It, everything we tried to do just worked seamlessly. Um, so Baldur's Gate gets a massive amount of props and um, I definitely think it's got to get game of the year um, for sure. Mm -hmm. 
No, but what do you think about uh, other gaming companies saying that we shouldn't be expecting that sort of game in the future? Like, it, I mean, to me, that that is that is something I want more of. That's yes. what Dragon Age Four should have been. You know, the Dragon Age Four we're never going to get. Absolutely. But I mean, th we should be holding them to that standard for some narrative stories, shouldn't we? Well, on one hand, yes. On one hand, no. Um, Larian Studios, who made um, Baldur's Gate mm -hmm. and the Divinity series, are an incredible team. Uh, Mind-blowing, actually. Um, but there are always limitations. Um, CD Projekt Red, who make The Witcher games yep. and Cyberpunk, we all really thought that they could get this out the door, you know, no crunch times or anything like that um but the game really did come out at a really bad state even after seven eight years um there really is only so much funding that you can get from a company before the game developers themselves are bled dry and have to you know stay overnight uh getting less pay to hold up to the standards of every gamer. Um, I 100% we should be say we should be going in direction, you know, bigger games and uh, denser, more importantly, um, keep the same quality. But um, we, the, the gaming industry does need time to um work out all the little issues first you know uh, there will mm -hmm. still always be after five years development probably five thousand bugs that the quality assurance has to fix and find and then right. you know they only have so many people to find them before they release it out in the world and then another million people find it and then call the game bad and um so i would never or i wouldn't say never but I would be more understanding if a game, if other companies just don't want to compete with Baldur's Gate because it is so mm. fast and impressive and there are so many options that people just will never click ever. Maybe 0.1% of pe players might actually press this button that leads to a whole nother story <laughs> for a character. Mm. Uh, it is a ton of work that you need to put in. But at the same time, um, I don't think we should um, make sacrifices for story. You know, do what you can, but be reasonable for the time we're in. Um, I, I, could, I could kick off a question here. Yeah, yeah. Um, might be a controversial, a controversial question, but because you do writing and you do do some artistry, would you be willing to sacrifice some of the graphics we've been seeing in games for a more comprehensive story? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, um, things some like of Octopath my favorite... 2 have really blown me away. Like, let's go back to some more sprite-based 8-bit games with some awesome yeah. stories. Yeah. I mean, definitely. Um, I think sprite-based games need a lot more attention because mm -hmm. they can just be incredible. And we do get a few every year, but like, um, I'm still waiting for a remake of Chrono Trigger. Like, yes. uh, <laughs> yeah, cause I still haven't played mm -hmm. Chrono Trigger, but it's the number one game I know I've had to play for years. So I'm a massive um, fan of low poly games because I think they're really mm -hmm. cool. You know, there's games like Disco Elysium that's uh, a bit 3d based but it's just water paint colors um journey uh that game journey where you're just going up a through a desert and up a mountain is one of the most incredible experiences in gaming and that doesn't require a lot and um, mainly just for um the desert because the game looks so good but um the journey really is the thing that's most important. And as long as the game works and uh, if you want to just back paddle on the graphics, feel free. You know, we're not mm -hmm. going to mind. The graphics are going to get better eventually. Um, but like when Final Fantasy XIV 1.0 came out, they made such a massive deal mm -hmm. about having the best graphics. And they might have, but I've never thought, uh, apart from uh, certain locations, um, I never thought 1.0 looked better than 
uh, of Ram Reborn or how it is now because they enhanced their design. It wasn't just the graphics. Mm -hmm. They actually designed the world to be so much prettier and uh, just really nice to look at and walk around in. So like you didn't need all those extra uh, pieces of graphical fidelity. You just need to create a beautiful, calming, uh, or exciting place to be in. And you can do that without graphics, uh, without heavy deal of graphics. Um, so uh, big props to the level designers, um, because I was really impressed when Around Reborn came out. I thought the game looked beautiful. I'll never forget um, first time I went in, it was during a Christmas event. The music hit just right. Mm. The lighting hit just right in all that. Um, it was a magical experience. And then I would hear, oh, the game looks worse than it did before. I'm like, no, it's perfectly <laughs> fine as it is. Yeah. Um, so no, I, I, there's so much to do with sprite work, with all different types of um, artistry. And, you know, we don't need to have perfect graphics to tell a good story. And if that's a sacrifice that, um, is it a sacrifice I'd be willing to make? Yeah, absolutely. Um, graphics will come with time naturally. Yeah, no, I'm glad to. I'm glad to hear it said. I'm glad to hear it said because it just it seems like we've kind of gone into like the Michael Bay of video games mm. lately. It's the the flashiest cutscenes, the uh, most uh, realistic looking figures and. Yeah. yeah, no, because even Cyberpunk is, um, although it's graphically impressive if you have the hardware, the world itself is gorgeous. Um, it's colored perfectly right, um, clearly handmade by all these uh, level designers. And um, the, the world just looks beautiful because it's crafted to be beautiful. It isn't because the graphics are the highest quality uh, that there is in gaming is because um, the world just genuinely looks fantastic and it's great to live in. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who doesn't know what we're talking about, think back to your earliest memory of playing video games. Like think back to the original Final Fantasy VII or, or Final Fantasy VIII or whatever your first game was where you were like, oh my God, this is amazing. And and look at how it looked now compared to, to other games. So, I, I mean... The imagination is a huge part oh yeah of that. absolutely yeah. and um but i'll definitely call back to kingdom hearts because um mm -hmm. that again does not have truly impressive graphics but what it does has have is a really timeless art style so even today kingdom hearts one and two look fantastic they look really good because there was a lot of work that went into the color and character design and the world design. They didn't need the highest level of detail. They just need to uh, be well designed mm -hmm. in a time in a very timeless fashion. So it didn't really it doesn't really it can be twenty years or forty years. The game will still be enjoyable to play and look at. There's certainly other games that. Um, to this day, it might have been 20 years ago since I played them, but I'm still overwhelmed by how good they look today. Whereas, you know, during the PlayStation 3 time, you know, you could think of Killzone or Haze or a lot of these other shooter games. They all look super, they all look very much the same, very gray, very muddy, very, very brown and just bloody. Um, there's a not a, the world just isn't as stylized and it's hard to pick out which is which at times because so many of them look so similar. Um, but definitely with options like HDR and um, a lot of different um, natural and like 4K, I don't have 4K, but um, we have so many options to make the screen look so much nicer, make the colors pop. So it really adds so much more to every new game that comes out. Absolutely. Um, I know we mentioned this a bit earlier, but have you ever faced any negative stereotypes or criticism for being a video game enthusiast? And how um, have you responded? Absolutely. Um, by growing up, it was definitely people of the older generation, the generation ahead of me, um, or 
uh, you know, the teachers at school, they would always be saying, you shouldn't be playing video games. It'll rot your brain. There's nothing to be learned. You'll go waste your life um, playing all these games. And the fact is they didn't understand or care to understand. They just um, made their minds up about what games were at the time. And they just put everyone else to that same standard. Uh, I... Uh, I wasn't just, and like when I tried to get into game development in school, I can't decide that's why that's where I wanted to go. But I was convinced by all the teachers to not pursue it because oh, it's too hard, or that's um, you know, you're not gonna be able for that. There's too much maths involved, and um, they would have just seen the technical side of game development and just assumed it's technical. But um, I was very much convinced that there was no other option for me to get into gaming. So I kind of gave it up when I was in school. And it took years to kind of get that confidence back that, you know what, maybe I can actually make a game. Maybe I can be a part of the industry as a designer or as a writer. Uh, there was just so many avenues that they would never considered or pointed me in. So. Um, I really took a knock on my confidence, especially because I couldn't really talk to anybody about it. Um, and then people my generation, like I said before, they pretty much only played FIFA and Call of Duty mm. multiplayer. And like I would pick up a Call of Duty, play the campaign, play two multiplayer missions, and then hand the game back in. Um, like that would be me done. Um, but then they would see the type of games I play, like Final Fantasy or whatever game I pick up, and you know they would laugh, they make fun, um, just because um, it was a different game. It looked too cutesy. Mm -hmm. It looked like it was for girls. Um, you know that sort of uh, just awkward comments. Um, but that's what that's something I really did love and appreciate. Um, with the wow exodus when there was like mm. a ton of people coming over because it was actually until then that like I actually felt felt like yes people actually understand they actually see the game for what it was and what it is now that they played it and there's so many more people playing it now that gave me a huge reason to just start the game over I blended in with all the wow people and uh, start fresh and have my own journey with them and that was fantastic um so i think it's really cool that um final fantasy and gaming in general has become a lot more accepted because it lets me kind of um put out stuff that i normally wouldn't put out um it lets me focus on um what i love pretty much um and it lets me really express myself in that way uh, I feel confident now to do it rather than a few years ago or definitely 10 years ago for sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Um, how do you balance your time between playing video games and your other responsibilities and activities? So not great. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I think um, that's going to be the go-to answer for almost everyone. I, I it think could be so. Better. Could be better. Um, could definitely be better. But um <laughs> You know, in the end, there's um, for pretty much anything you do, you have to decide, uh, you know, what to spend your time on. And there is so many options now. We don't just have, you know, that one game on the shelf. You know, for the price of half a game, you could get like three months of Game Pass and you could get like a mm -hmm. massive library of unbelievable games that you can spend years on. And uh, we're just so. Um, spoiled for choice and spoiled for options so we do have to make concessions in uh what activities we play how much um time we want to put into that um but for sure i've never skipped an interview or skipped a day of school because um because i want to play a game i just it's one thing you just always keep in your head if you have an interview go to the interview you know um you should have a balance between your gaming life and then your outside life because there is so much more to see and um the more you reflect on reality the uh more expressive these fictional games and stories can be you get to really draw a parallel there and it is good to 
uh, go out, meet friends, meet new people, stay healthy. Um, so yeah, you know, I might be playing games a bit more than I should be, but I also want to play them so much more. You know, I have so many more games that I would love to play. But yeah, it's just, it's a day by day basis. You just, um, you do what you can. <laughs> That's a very real answer. I mean, I've never missed work because of a video game, but I mm. have booked time off around video I, games. I yes, so. <laughs> Final Fantasy sixteen was the last one I did. Yeah, um, I took two straight. I booked two weeks holidays just so I can focus on beating Final Fantasy sixteen and then making a video about it. Um, but the video I was writing was getting so long and so long and so long that I was like, well, I can't really. I can't ask for a third week off, can I? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I actually had to put down the back burner for a bit um, just because it was getting so big and I do want to really reconsider mm -hmm. my options uh, when it comes to making a 16 video because there is so much to say and so much to talk about um, that I want to just get it right and make sure that um, I don't screw it up. <laughs> I think a lot of the community has kind of been very silent on 16 in respect for the PC mm. players who haven't had an opportunity to play it yet. But yes. I mean, it was it was an experience. Like, I don't think I played Final Fantasy 16. I think it played me. Like, oh, yeah, it, big time. It is just the music, the visuals. It is an experience. There is no other way to describe it. So yeah. I'm excited to get to talk about it as soon as like everyone has had an opportunity to enjoy yeah, it. Yeah, for sure. sure. Because uh, that is something I would have never paid attention to, um, you know, having to wait for PC players to play it. Because mm -hmm. um, normally it was always kind of the other way around. You know, yes. the PlayStation yeah. would have to wait. Um, but when it comes to a game like that, you really want somebody to have their own experience with it. And they will, and by the time PC people get it, they'll have all the free updates. The game will be better. It'll probably come out with whatever DLC comes out. And then PlayStation gets all those versions. I was really happy to see that they put in an update that lets you change your clothes. Um, yeah, so he pretty much spending the whole game in one outfit um, can take you out of it a good mm -hmm. bit. So it is nice to have different options. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I can't wait to talk about it either. There is a lot to talk about, and um, I just hope everyone enjoys it. If they don't, I'm sure we'll have plenty of discussions online about it. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. Uh, can you share a favorite video game memory or experience that has had a lasting impact on you? Um, God, there would be so many to choose from. Um, so, okay. Yeah. I can think of... Uh, two that are kind of relevant um beating kingdom hearts one was immense it was the first type of game that had me go on such a massive journey and that they have final boss after final boss after final boss and you're like when is it gonna end i'm not sure how <laughs> much i can keep this up and my brother was sitting right beside me because it was on his playstation um to and he hadn't reached that stage yet so he was sitting there cheering me on it's like you can do it you can do it just don't die <laughs> <laughs> um, so i remember beating the game kind of being a bit shook and i went to bed and you know as a kid i just kind of cried because i couldn't believe that that was an experience i went on and mm. not many people except for like my brother and maybe one person at school um would know that feeling uh so it almost felt lonely in a what in a way because um how can i convey that i've actually been on that journey um but a bit more recently uh when me and my brother got heaven's ward we hadn't you know uh we got the playstation 4 version of heaven's word so it came with the realm reborn and we decided mm -hmm. to start over um and we reached the very end of a realm reborn i'm not sure if i'm allowed to talk about it in case of spoilers but um 
it was an occasion where the both of us we hit the you know several cutscenes we'll play yeah yeah the sequence moments and we all kind of have a heart attack and then we got our uh, tea and everything and I just remember late at night we were on call to each other and you know we were timing the dialogue presses together so we were uh -huh. at the exact moment and then all this crazy stuff was happening and we were just like oh my god did you see that um so yeah i have a lot of fun memories playing games with my brother because he liked a lot of the same games that mm -hmm. i played and he got me into a lot of these games so i could always share my experiences with him so um yeah those are some of my favorite memories i could go on and on but that uh, those two kind of stick in my mind no, it's such a beautiful memory. And mm. I was just thinking too, like at the end of every Final Fantasy XIV expansion, like I'm always in the exact same position, like staring at the screen with tears pouring tears. down my face. <laughs> my heart is broken. <laughs> it's like it's always an experience. Yeah. And that hasn't changed no. <laughs> at all. Uh, how do you see video games continuing to impact your life into the future? Um, well... I'm looking forward to seeing, uh, like currently I'm working a lot with 3D building and uh, 3D animation. And as games progress, we kind of have more options on what uh, characters we can use, what um, situations we can put them in, how to blend um, all these options with other games um, and other mediums like film and sometimes books. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm really looking forward to not only just playing and seeing all these new experiences, but to be actual, actually able to take parts of that, bring it into my own work and just, um, I would never expect me to stop playing games at any point because games are just going to get bigger and bigger and more expensive and um i'm really looking forward to just seeing how that uh our form our form uh evolves and just like we've seen so much happen so much difference in just the past 30 years alone where the next 30 years going to be like you know it wasn't that long ago we had no man's sky which was literally a full galaxy to explore mm -hmm. uh total freedom um, and that game only got bigger and bigger and bigger and more dense and more people playing it. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to just seeing what video games become in the future and how they'll evolve, for sure. No, it's exciting. Um, Moody and I talked a bit about uh, VR on the last mm. podcast. Uh, are, are you pro-VR or, or anti or cautiously no. optimistic? You know what, I am um, a bit more of the latter, for sure. Um, <laughs> right. Well, yeah, no, one of the things uh, I can't promise myself, you know, if I finish college, if I get the grades I wanted, screw everything on buying a PlayStation VR. I'm just getting it. I'm going to enjoy <laughs> myself and see what it's like. And that's what I did. And I bought way more games than I should have because I was kind of looking for that true VR experience mm. and the potential was definitely there is, um, but it really kind of reminded me every game I played, it reminded me of a PlayStation one game. And it was like, we're at the first generation of mm. VR and games in VR. Pe some games will let you pick up something. Some games will not let you pick up something because they focus on other things. And then when more and more VR came out and second generation happened, um, it was pretty much standard to be able to pick up things and be able to run. And um, so you could see a lot of the games that were coming out were just trying different things to see if they could try it out and how people right. would react. And um, then when the next generation came out, they kind of just piled what they knew so far. And now they're trying out more things and more things. And I absolutely love VR. But what kind of made me stop playing was um, I don't like the wire. Mm. The wire is very intrusive. Um, I don't mind if it's just one, but like the PlayStation setup 
it was one wire but like you had to clear a massive space just to have all the um wires and cables going into the tv it was like six or seven different wires um but also the resolution it got to a point where i literally couldn't see a couple meters in front of me like if i played skyrim and picked up a bow and tried to aim at somebody's head i literally couldn't see the head because their whole body was just so pixelated right um so Overall, I just kind of walked away thinking maybe PlayStation VR 2, maybe VR 3, I'll pick it up and see what things are like again. I think it's it was just too early. I really enjoyed mm -hmm. my time, and it was great for exercise. I did so much boxing VR <laughs> and uh, running VR and all that. Um, but, um, yeah, it was just I felt like it was in its early stages whenever I picked up a game. And then I really wasn't happy when PlayStation announced that you can carry over um, the games you already bought onto VR2 because I felt mm. that was like, oh, well, now I can't. Now I'll just have to buy them all again. You know what? Screw it. I'll wait till the next VR comes right. out. Um, so I really can't wait to see where VR goes. Um, but I am really looking forward to when VRs are cheap and really high quality and, you know, they're not too heavy. They have no wire um, or it's less intrusive um, and then just resolution and everything gets better. Honestly, what I saw from PlayStation VR 2 was pretty much what I was looking for, um, except the not being able to play, play the past games. So it won't be long before I'm back on VR because I've had some really crazy experiences on them, even like interacting with other people. You walk up to another person, you start booping them on the head. And it's like, <laughs> oh my God, you you actually exist. You're not just, you're not just an NPC. Um, so yeah, I'm really looking forward to VR in the future, but I definitely stop playing it for now. Just, I want to see it being built upon a lot more. No, that's a fantastic point. And I think I remember saying something very similar at the advent of uh, modern gaming with the Wii, uh, where mm. you were just using the the joystick to control the cursor on screen. And I'm like, yeah, this will be great in, in years when it gets perfected. Uh, if, uh, if the Wii's evolution has been any example as to what VR might become, uh, then we're definitely in for a treat. Because for sure, when uh, I loved the Wii when it came out, but then eventually you learned that for the boxing mm -hmm. Wii Sports uh, game, you didn't have to box at all. You didn't have to actually <laughs> put the exercise in. You just had to go like yeah, that yeah. with the controllers and you're the best. And that just kind of ruined everything. Suddenly you're the best at everything. You got no exercise. You're lazily on the couch, just pretty much defeating the purpose of why you bought the thing in the first place. But then when PlayStation Move came out before the VR came out, um, mm -hmm. I re they really tested out the 3D space with what technology they could. And um, so, you know, if you had to pull back an arrow, you really did have to pull it out because mm -hmm. they were using the PlayStation Eye to scan the room around you. So you had to use the 3D space. So you couldn't just cheat and uh, wiggle the thing around. Um, <laughs> How do you think video games have impacted the entertainment industry as a whole? Um, you know what? It is actually kind of hard to say. There is definitely... Um, they definitely kind of used um, games in a way to see how graphics could improve the kind of base level line of uh, graphics. And um, there are occasions where some movies go a bit too far um showing um you know for the one thing that comes to mind is uh the hobbit and the mm. hobbit movie uh suddenly at some point it just seemed like it turned into a video game which i don't mind but then when you see all these characters uh survive all these crazy stunts that definitely shouldn't they shouldn't have been able to survive it can take you out of the moment it can kind of distract from the story um but i think we're starting to see a lot of really good adaptations now or the potential for really good adaptations one of the first uh, ones i ever saw going from game to movie that i thought was really good was silent hill um mm -hmm. because they didn't just copy and paste it they changed things around they worked 
with what they had for the first game because the first game was super vague. Um, but and even the director was uh, reading the script and the main character is the father. But when they were reading the script, they're like, I'm reading as if that was a woman. So they actually cast it as a woman and that was, so they dramatically, you know, gender swapped the character, but it just fits so much better in the film. That was an extremely well done decision. Um, and you're even like with One Piece, the uh, anime live action mm. that came out, yeah. um, like a normal person who wouldn't be, or like a person who wouldn't be into um, the show or the anime show, they might watch it and not really understand it, or they might not like it. But the fact is, it, for anybody who has watched the original series, you can see how much love and detail went into the live action version. It might not have been perfect, but like they really gave it a go. And I think that's kind of the more, I think it comes down to people just don't want to see half measures. You know, like you mentioned um, in that uh, interview with uh, Mumba was uh, Sonic the Hedgehog. They heard the fan yes, outcry yes. to change it. Um, that it, that in itself was a half measure. They want Sonic to look like a game, but they want it to look kind of realistic. They want to make it more human, I guess. But then the fans were just like, you just make it the same character. Make it look really weird. Make it look far out there. And I watched Sonic the Hedgehog. I thought it was a great movie. Mm -hmm. Like, I yep. thought it was a really, really solid adaptation. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing the Super Mario movie because um, I still haven't seen it. And it's everyone it, just yeah. says it's amazing. Uh, it was so well done. That it definitely looks it. You know, everyone was making fun that uh, Chris Pratt uh, was now uh, doing the Mario voice. But... Um, uh amazingly the film still turned out brilliantly i've seen jack black's performance as bowser and i just think oh he's perfection yeah i just think it's hilarious <laughs> he absolutely nailed it and even luigi yeah. uh with charlie day um they really picked the right cast and um, i'm really looking forward to seeing it yeah, I mean, I I think bottom line is we just want to see um, the movies that represent these franchises we love uh, being treated with the love and respect that we we see in them. Like, yeah, yeah. whatever you're going to do, at least show us that you care about it and and it is a labor of love and it was, you know, intentional. Yeah, for sure. Because um, I can understand it from a filmmaker's point of view. You might say, oh, well, they are fans already know the story. So we may as well change the ending of it to make it more suited to our TV watchers and or movie watchers. And uh, from doing that, you have uh, movies that just become disjointed. And again, with the half measures, they just feel half-hearted. Um, I think in the end, fans of games and uh, shows like animes, um, they want you to just go for it. You know, just uh, throw the bars down and just make it as crazy as uh, the original was. Or um, just, it can be hard to pinpoint where the heart in every story is. But when you get it and work with it, you know your boundaries and you respect the lore, uh, you can create something absolutely fantastic that both new watchers and um, fans of, the old series they all uh, come together and they just love it Absolutely. there's definitely potential in the future um for more movies hopefully a final fantasy 14 show yeah that starts and from 1.0 <laughs> that would be very that would be really cool it would be amazing like we got that sneak peek i can put the link in the description of that korean anime that they were they were hinting at really which was good just looking amazing really yeah yeah they I, really I would watch that i would watch that oh so. yeah 100 percent. and um, hopefully the the one piece re uh live action is kind of a a new beginning of um uh adaptations that actually work Yes, um, absolutely. Because it's kind of the first example of a, an anime to, to real life transition that actually was successful. 
<laughs> yeah, it oh. seems like it. Although I still haven't seen Italia Battle Angel. Um, mm. That one I kept seeing the ads for, and I never saw the original uh, thing it's based off. But uh, it's definitely something that's been in my mind that I do want to take a look at because it does look fantastic, and I have no idea if it's good. So we'll find awesome. out. Yeah, I was going to say someone in the comments is probably going to add that info in. So. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever played a video game that inspired you to pursue a certain career <laughs> or field of study? I'm going to guess yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, definitely. Like I said, Kingdom Hearts 1 and Final Fantasy X were like something clicked and just mm -hmm. made sense. Uh, or not that it made sense, but something really clicked and there was a certain direction I want uh, games to go in. I kind of made me want to be able to create something like that. And, you know, there's been a bunch of times where I've, you know, as a human, you feel alone or you feel sad or you feel angry and you just pick up the right game and you just hang out in that world for a little bit and you meet up all these characters that you love uh, to see and maybe you know, take on a bank together you know if especially if you're like into payday you might just be like let's just rob a bank you know let's just go <laughs> or like a lot of times i just um sometimes when i'm bored and not sure what to do i'll just hop on to final fantasy and just kind of drive through the world mm. from point to point because oh, yeah. it's just a nice um it's just a nice peaceful relaxing time in general is just to kind of just explore world and um but the main thing uh yeah um it certainly changed my it focused my direction in terms of art and music and being able to create stories with fantastic characters so i'm still an early uh youtuber for sure but i have uh a tongue in mind that I just can't wait to uh, make. I can't wait to see how it, they turn out. I can't wait to watch them myself, and then I can't wait to see other people's reactions to them. Um, so even uh, what I'm doing next month is I'm going to be um, creating my... I'm going to be creating more of my own uh, 3D characters, and I'm going to 3D print them in the uh, art okay. studio that I work at. So I'm really looking forward to that experience where I can actually just uh, have a few of my favorite characters just <laughs> sitting on the PC and, you know, just uh, make them look good and just kind of broaden your horizons in terms of what you can make. Um, so that's something I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, that is amazing. Um, have you... How do you think video games can be used as a tool for education or personal development? Um, well, I actually learned a lot from uh, games that let you actually create levels and build your own creations. Mm. So I'm sure like there are ones like Tony Hawk uh, Pro Skater the uh, on PlayStation 1 that have really famous level creator that just kind of let you build whatever you want to build. And things just kind of got better over time. But one game in particular called Little Big Planet. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was extremely <laughs> helpful when it came to uh, making games and figuring out how they work and making animations because... They give you so many tools to work with. And then when Little Big Planet 2 came out, you could insert a microchip into a character or an object and give it proper programming. So I got a kind of hint of uh, programming just from trying to make levels in that game. There are so many um, things I was able to bring from those type of games into, uh, say, Unity or Unreal Engine or... Um, uh, definitely 3D software, because it's always, they make it so simplified. They take out all the complexity and just uh, let people create what they want to create uh, with some limitations. And um, But then when you start to pick up a new piece of software and it seems so complicated, suddenly you start recognizing a bunch of these buttons. 
um, a bunch of these buttons that were, you used previously in a level making game. And then uh, the same people who made Low Big Planet went on to make Dreams. And I love Dreams. It was definitely a hard uh, game to market, but it was basically a YouTube for gamers. Or YouTube for artists and you just had free reign to create whatever you thought was great everything from music to art to movies to animations to actual games uh, and people really put forward their best um, their best products and try to help each other out you could comment on other people's stuff you could uh, remix other people's stuff and use their uh, use their models or their mm -hmm. voice or whatever they create into your own stuff create something massive together and definitely you see a lot more now um the younger generation have a lot more access to coding which is something that was never really shown off in um in our school when i was there um it's an extremely beneficial too but they they try to make it look almost like a game and make it easier to understand and i just think um, video games can definitely be used as a tool, almost like a gateway, you know, uh, shows you, removes all complexity, shows you something you can understand and use. And then once you're ready, you can break out into something much bigger and something professional and work with a team. And you will have gotten all your um, previous experience on working on a big project together from a game. So yeah, I think there's tons of potential and definitely helped me when I was learning uh, a bunch of different editing software and 3D software and sound software and film. Helped me with all of that. Just gave me a basic level of understanding that I was able to use um, all throughout college and my professional life. So yeah, absolutely, I think it can. I never thought of it that way, but yeah, games teaching gamers, teaching game devs, <laughs> like it's, We're it's all just a one big inception. circle, yeah. <laughs> For sure. awesome. Have you ever played a video game that helped you cope with a difficult time in your life? Um, yeah, I mean, nonstop, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. But um, yeah, no, there's been a bunch of different occasions where... Um, you know, you might not be through a good space. Um, you know, you might just be kind of fish out of the water and just you might be um, not sure what to do it yourself or um, you just feel alone. But there's a lot of games out there that kind of let you explore what you're thinking because other artists have been through the same issues and similar issues to you. And then they created something that uh, allows them to express it and you to understand it. Um, I haven't played Greece, but that was definitely a game that Moody Moomba mentioned. Yeah. Um, and I know a lot of people love it. Um, uh, one, a good few of my friends um, would swear by Night in the Woods which I have yet to play. Mm. It's a game that definitely uh, explores that sort of, um, you know, that sadness. Um, there's so much. Um, but yeah, there were definitely times where like I had to stay in a brand new, in like my new student apartment for the uh, summer. I decided to spend the actual three months there um, before people came, but I didn't realize that how lonely that would actually be because it was essentially the entire apartment block to myself and I had oh. to be that way for three months. Um, so I just picked up a few games and uh, <laughs> there were definitely lonely moments, but it definitely helped the time kind of pass by and um, gave me less time to just think about my own uh, issues. Um, yeah, actually there is one other thing that I think is pretty interesting. Um, when I was about 15, I had to get uh, foot surgery. Uh, and it was incredibly painful the day after. Um, oh. The day after surgery, when all the pressure and everything came in, it was uh, extremely difficult to deal with. Um, but I, I had an idea. Normally, I only play games on 
uh, beginner difficulty or casual difficulty because I don't want to keep dying. I want to see yeah, the, story. the story. Yeah, the story, yeah. But I decided I would play the Uncharted, or sorry, the Uncharted franchise mm -hmm. um, on crushing difficulty. Mm -hmm. So it's hardest difficulty. Mm -hmm. And something I noticed was when I was playing the game on crushing, I didn't feel any pain whatsoever because my <laughs> mind was so focused on not dying. Um, but then the funny thing is, whenever I died, there was a 10 second loading screen, and then the pain would come back during the loading screen. So that gave me a massive incentive not to die. Yeah, um, just keep the adrenaline up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but then from there, I gained a massive love for challenging games. And uh, I beat all those games on um, the hardest difficulty. And I often play games on hard mode now. So I can see my own character progress. You know, I. I am that type of person that will happily just hit my head against the wall over and over again until the wall breaks. And um, I love seeing my own character and feeling like I really progressed, like this enemy that you couldn't, you couldn't stand a chance against before. And now he doesn't stand a chance against you. Um, so I definitely grew a love uh, for challenging games like Dark Souls and Elden Ring. Um, simply because I had to deal with uh, surgery pain. I had to find a way to deal with um, not being in pain all the time for like at least five days. So I just put on the hardest games I knew and just uh, kind of see if I could push past my limits, and I did. And awesome. the pain is gone. <laughs> you exchanged pain for suffering and came yes, on Yes. Yes. <laughs> so. Uh, how do you think video games can be used to bring people together and build communities? Definitely what I was saying before about dreams um, and games like Little Big Planet actually offering you up um, the ability to build a community around their game and to, to work together. But when you don't really have that, when you don't have a game that's dedicated to building a community, um, it's kind of left up to the players themselves to do it you know um go out there and write a fan story make a trailer uh, make a new player experience go on twitch and stream a game that you love mm -hmm. and um enjoy it with other people and um yeah i just kind of feel like once once people who are so normally not used to talking to other people about experiences that they might have had once they finally meet someone who is like that, there is a bit of a connection formed already just from that. We live in a time now where communities are almost built into games. Hmm. Uh, like back when we used to play Sega and Nintendo and stuff, the, the, the community was the Nintendo Power magazine or the guide you used to get through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now you can just log into the computer and look at Discord, look at uh, forums, look at yeah, anything, absolutely. and you can find so many people talking about it. Yeah, for sure. Um, and, so we um, almost take it for granted that pretty much anything absolutely. you enjoy, you can go online and find a group of people who appreciate it too. I definitely felt that with VR as well, because there was a game called Rec Room, which was kind of just like a, almost like VR chat, but, you know, super friendly. Um, but again, it was just like about 10 people putting on their VR heads, headsets, doing the funniest thing, just laughing at each <laughs> other because they're all just poking each other on the head and trying to force feed each other pizza and just because you can. Um there is a lot of room to enjoy the things you enjoy with other people that enjoy them. And I think that's really special because uh, I just didn't have that growing up. I always loved uh, playing multiplayer or like, you know, co-op games, but there mm -hmm. wasn't much room for that. I didn't know that many people play the same games. So now it's very cool that I can just, within seconds, turn on the game, link up with a friend, uh, and just play together for hours. Um, you have so many options, whether you want to use a headset, you want to emote at them, you just want to uh, type alongside them. But I think um, there are other great examples of, say, when uh, Japan had its uh, had the massive tsunami 
um that kind of dev stage japan they uh yoshi p had to or final fantasy crew had to shut down the servers for a bit while they were working on a realm reborn um and they were doing it out of respect i believe as well but then people started saying that the only way that they could contact their friends and make sure they were okay was from going on to final fantasy online and then communicating with them that way because the phone lines were down so um in a way that game was used as an opportunity to reach in touch with people who could potentially be in danger and need help so um there is a lot more room and options for that to become a bigger possibility in the future and um honestly it's down to fans of the communities to kind of um reach out and try and build a community um and it's always great to be a part of something um that you love and that other people share that love as well yeah yeah and just from all over the world it's just as easy to meet and make friends with someone across the the ocean than it is yes in absolutely. your backyard yeah yeah, no, it is fantastic in that sense that like I can play with people in other countries and there's no lag or there's no, you know, nothing actually mm -hmm. stopping us. And, um, you know, friends and family might never have talked to anyone outside of Ireland, but you've, well, I've been able to talk to people um, from Japan, from America, from Canada, mm -hmm. from um, France and Germany, and really get to know these people. and. Uh, had the best time with them and especially one thing you were saying before about um, how covid helped you deal with uh, a bad time in your life when covid hit um you know those one to two years where everything was in lockdown i never really considered online friends to be proper friends you know they're just right. people you meet online but um i was really shown how wrong that was um during the first year of covid because i just had the best time with my online mates we were all checking in on each other um just try to enjoy what we could together and we were building shows and we were they were helping me out with my videos uh we were buying each other gifts and it's like a full free company of all that and um just to, seeing all the players you meet along the way because i am one of those people who will just randomly open a trade with you and hand you a hot <laughs> you know hand you a coffee and a biscuit yeah, yeah. and then walk right off as if nothing happened um so yeah i really do love just being able to connect with all these different types of people who share so many similarities but you would have never met them otherwise and that's why i love video games um for building communities for sure no, that's a beautiful sentiment i can't improve upon that at all uh, have you ever played a video game that challenged your beliefs or changed your worldview at all? Actually, um, yeah, I mean, definitely when I was younger, um, definitely uh, more a religious time in Ireland. Um, I was definitely brought up Catholic and um, uh so my and like of course if you said anything against religion or if you questioned anything you get kind of shut down and you know don't say that sort of thing mm -hmm. but when i played final fantasy 10 that was kind of my first glimpse into uh how people in positions of power can abuse that power and um that not everyone um is following the same code and you know, uh, what some people might believe as hard facts and shouldn't be changed, other people would suggest are guidelines or mm -hmm. um, or just shouldn't be there in the first place. So Final Fantasy X, in a way, really um, gave me that, uh, sort of gave me that leeway into asking questions and uh, really, you know, not accepting simple answers uh, when it's something serious, you know. Um, so definitely as a young kid, that uh, led me to uh, really just open my mind a bit more, start questioning things that I think are confusing. Um, but more recently, which I find really interesting, um, I was playing the 
the DLC, uh, the expansion for Cyberpunk, uh, Phantom mm -hmm. Liberty with Idris Elba and Keanu Reeves. And at one point, just as a little side thing, um, the president, yes, the president happens to be there. Um, she asks you if you want to take an oath, you know, be an official spy. And in my own head, I was like, I'll take the oath, you know, <laughs> you know, more power for me. Um, and I, I kind of determined that my character, I do what I can to make sure my character survives. I think, mm -hmm. you know, I really love the main character in cyberpunk. Uh, I heard there were new endings for cyberpunk. And I just want the best outcome for her. Um, but, uh, all of a sudden, now this president wanted me to take an oath. And I was like, yeah, I'll take it. No problem. More power. And then Keanu Reeves is at the side looking all ashamed and disappointed. And I'm just like, you know, shove it. <laughs> um, but then they kind of let you back out of the oath. And I was like, no, I'll take the oath. And then she starts going into more detail. Uh, you know, pledge your allegiance to the new USA. Um you know, and then it lets it gives you the option to back out again. And then I thought it was a bit weird. Suddenly, this thing that I don't obviously doesn't really matter. Uh, they're making me take it a bit more seriously. <laughs> um, so then I'm like, screw it, I'll just do it. And then she was like, uh, you know, repeat after me. I give my, I will do all mm -hmm. I can to give my life for this country. And then all of a sudden, it kind of just clicked in me that by taking the oath, something that I kind of saw as a joke, I might actively be doing something against my original intentions. Like, I want my character to live, but now this other person is asking me to swear my life away. Mm. If this was 10 or 20 years ago, I was like, there's got to be the same outcome. But in this type of game, you literally don't know what is going to kill your own character. And... Um, you don't know the bad decisions you might have taken. And that whole expansion and the whole game is such a massive emotional roller coaster. And they made me pick options that I actually had to put the controller down and think about for a sec. I really needed to just kind of catch my breath. I wasn't sure what I was doing was the right thing. Um, but I just stuck to the guns. My character is going to live. And in the end, I made such bad decisions that yeah my character was living but it was not the best life <laughs> <laughs> so at the same time there was so there were so many things in play there where you know something i kind of got the feeling that i was taking an actual oath mm -hmm. even though it was just in a game because it dawned on me midway through that this could actually have dire consequences. And then it had me thinking, well, if I had to take an oath like that in real life, would I now be choked up about it or would I be as carefree as before? So yeah, there's a, and that's just such a tiny, tiny portion of the game that a lot of people might not have even, you know, thought two seconds about. But yeah, it did actually challenge my beliefs and worldview on how far I'd be willing to go to make sure my character lives. <laughs> no, that's amazing. And I, I think you're right. I think maybe gamers are some of the more critical thinkers out there. We're, we're searching okay. we're searching for every possibility before we press the button yeah. in real life or in game. Yeah. And thankfully, there's a reload option, which is always <laughs> fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, how do you think video games can be used to promote empathy and understanding of different perspectives? I mean, I think everything we've been talking about has kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Because, um, you know, being able to see some, being able to see something in somebody else's uh, worldview or point of view, or, you know, even being able to kind of take yourself out and be like, um, you know, Put, you know, start playing uh, the gender opposite to you or start mm -hmm. playing the race um, that's totally different from yours and see if uh, people react differently and um, how do they react differently and um, what troubles do they go through? What don't they go through? Did, 
did the developer actually put much thought into this? How much research did they do on this? Um, so there's so much option. I've I've always felt extremely emotional when it came to well written games and uh, well written stories and games because you're not just seeing the end of the story. It's your story and you have to make these decisions and decide to push on and push through and you start feeling like you become these characters. And um, for example, with Last of Us, um, I absolutely love Ellie. Ellie is one of my favorite characters in gaming. Uh, and then what you had to do with her in um, Last of Us 2 was kind of breaking my heart as if I was a father figure. Because in the end, I might not be Ellie, but I make the final decision on what she does. Mm -hmm. So in a way, I'm supporting her, but I shouldn't be. I shouldn't be pushing her down this path, and you don't want to. And you know, some moments will just take your breath away because you you led her there, but you're out of control during a cutscene. What she does is down to her, and you're just seeing this. Um, you can just see this person dissolve into hatred and anger and it's not the person you want to see you know when you saw her as a kid you know so many years ago when the first game come out but like real life some things just get the better of us and we can't handle uh, certain losses and we can't um, accept the way things are and it can very easily lead us to a darker path where we just don't really get what we want from it or maybe we did but it wasn't worth it so there's so many ways i think that's the thing i love most about gaming um apart from the uh idea of discovery is the ability to feel something for characters that genuinely do not exist they were literally made and yet they feel real mm -hmm. but they do that because they're written and they're made by real people who want to convey a message and um that is just gonna get more and more impressive um Cor corey barlog the, um directed the god of war reboot and the other games mm -hmm. he said um we got to a certain point in life where you know everything was just a game all the games that were coming out all the new consoles they were always just trying different gimmicks you know let's add analog controllers or let's um make this game 3d or you know let's push the boundaries of this game but we're getting to the stage now where we're able to tell truly cinematic stories with fully realized characters and explore uh potential in that that other mediums just could not do and there's plenty of games that like like near replicant or near automata mm. or um you know anything made by hideo kojima for metal gear solid you simply can't copy and paste it into um a movie or a book because they're just entirely different experiences um they're entirely different mediums and ways of playing it and ways of engaging because in the end in when you're controlling a character you are that character and your decisions mm -hmm. actually matter whereas like a movie nothing's got to change it's always going to be in front of your screen so that's where i think uh video games definitely come above any other medium in um being able to promote empathy and understanding of different perspectives and different people yeah no, it's it's astronomical. Like think of the the think of your favorite movie protagonist and then think mm. of instead of spending 3 hours with them you're spending 40 to 60 hours with them. That's yeah. that's the degree of attachment we have for yeah, these video absolutely. game characters. Yeah. Yeah, 100% and being able to actually control them and um take every step they do and be on the same journey is uh, something that just can't be recreated as well in other forms um but then again other forms find their own ways of conveying that emotion mm -hmm. um so that's why i really love just about uh, um you need to know where your story is better off um so 
that's where I kind of find it challenging. Sometimes I don't know if I want to make an animation or if I want to use game assets or if I want to make a movie or a 2D animation. Um, it's all about finding the right medium to convey the story you want to tell. Have you ever switched mediums? Like, have you begun creating a, a an artwork and then decided, hey, this would be better as something else? Or Yes. Um, I mean, loads of times, loads and loads <laughs> of times. But um, I'd say more, most recently, um, I made that video called Reina's Theme, which mm -hmm. was um, kind of like I had my characters uh, play the play the music from Final Fantasy V because I picked up Final Fantasy V one day, got 10 minutes in, and I was hit with this soundtrack that blew me away. And I couldn't believe it was the original soundtrack. It wasn't like a remastered version. Right. Uh, so I just had the picture of my own characters playing it. But I could only go so far using certain game assets. Not every finger motion was the correct note on the instrument that they were mm -hmm. playing. So I have been like, okay, that is something I would like to do in Blender or in Maya or you know 3D animation because then I do have full control. Uh, and that's what kind of led me on the path now because I, um, I just want more control over the animations of certain scenes. I think it's important to kind of um, you know, have the right eye twitch and uh, the mm. right smirk and um, the right pausing and something you just can't do with pre-made assets. So that is um, that is a medium I switched to based on a single video that I made. But all that's doing is exploring uh, more possibilities. And I'm. it's not like I switched completely from one or the mm -hmm. other. I'm learning to mix them together and to use which is appropriate and see, um, again, just uh, how to convey the best story I can. Awesome. Uh, have you played a video game that you felt had a particularly impactful story or message? So kind of similar to, to something yes. we talked about. Um, I mean, I will give a shout out to, um, I mean, there are so many games Um I haven't even mentioned, but um, the Mass Effect trilogy, mm. truly, truly impactful. Um, a, a journey that you, a journey with companions that you do love over the course of a trilogy and how your decisions really do play into that. Um, it got a totally updated ending, which I thought was, you know, fantastic. Um, <clears throat> Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker, and Shadowbringers mm -hmm. were heartbreaking and mind blowing. Um, for like without spoilers, just the name Vana. She's one of my favorite characters ever made. She's just so cool uh, and s has some of the best scenes in the entire game. Uh, Metal Gear Solid and God of War. God of War, um, a story of uh, a father and a son who don't know how to connect and have to go on a trip together to do something important to say goodbye to their mother while still learning how to actually fit in with each other's lives. Uh, father has to learn how to be a father and the son has to understand his, where the father's coming from, that they're dealing with their own pains and situations and that they don't know how to cope. You might think they can cope because they're your dad and they're a big, strong man. Um, but everyone has those issues and that they were shown that a God is not exempt uh, from those. So those were extremely powerful uh, stories. And Soma, Soma uh, indie game made by, I believe the Amnesia um, developers, that was an incredible story about copying memories and what we leave behind and the risks you're willing to take. Uh, Last of Us 2 being a story about revenge and how far you're willing to go. Um, truly amazing uh, stories and journeys that really hit hard and you know, really make you consider um, what someone would have to go through or see somebody else's perspective and you try to understand theirs. But um, uh, 
Yeah, I'd say one of my favorite scenes in the past year was definitely a scene in particular with Fana. I wouldn't spoil mm -hmm. it, but yeah, no, she earns the top spot um, for uh, best scene of the year for the yeah. next. No, those are all great call outs, but especially Endwalker. We were all kind of on the edge of our seat wondering how they were going to close this arc, especially mm. people who have been playing for nine years, 10 years. Like, how yeah, are they yeah. going to give us the emotional satisfaction? And uh, they did it. They nailed they, it. They figured it out. They nailed like, it. They did it. <laughs> and, like, it's not just Endwalker. Shadowbringers and Endwalker kind yeah. of go hand in hand. They just complement each other so incredibly well. Um, mm -hmm almost seeming like opposites because yeah. you have like Vena and Emmett Selk who have very similar scenes but they definitely come from different backgrounds mm -hmm. um so yeah fantastic job and I'm really looking forward to seeing what happens next yeah. uh how do you think video games can be used to address social or political issues uh, so seeing how neither of us are American, we have a very <laughs> unique perspective on this. But um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Um, I mean, they certainly can. Um, maybe so giving you ideas into, or, or yeah, sort of ideas into situations we might uh, find ourselves in in real life. Um like say Mass Effect with the Janophage storyline with uh, mm -hmm. the Krogans who uh, were kind of built from a primitive stage by other races, but then they built themselves up too quickly. And uh, so then they went on rampage, taking planet by planet. And then eventually another race decided, well, we should neuter them. We should make sure that they should never have kids again. Um, and that might calm them down. And then suddenly you have an entire race that's um, scarred and forever changed by the actions of another party. Um, little things like that. And it's not like uh, in our life, um, you know, aliens are neutering each other. And that's an <laughs> issue that we have to deal with. But it does kind of show um, or give you the idea that there are some really... Uh, heinous acts that people must commit or will commit uh, to fix a mistake that they made uh, and it shows um, the ramifications of such an issue um, how it can affect the um, victims and the perpetrators and uh, how that can even have a long lasting effect and that's just one idea from one story in one of the games um mm. there's a lot of ways um you know something real life uh, that's going on in real life can be subtly or not so subtly um put into a game um by one of the developers and it does get us talking about it again because you know sometimes a new cycle not sometimes, pretty much all the time. The news cycle will only show something for about two weeks before people get bored and they move on and uh, say, like, um, you know, there would be uh, situations that you think, oh, well, they don't report on the news anymore. It must not, it must no longer be an issue. But in fact, it's been an issue for years. It's still ongoing. And, um, sometimes we need an extra reminder that certain things are still going on and i feel like games are a great way to kind of show that and you know a lot of games love to show what happens in the post-apocalypse of something that might have happened you know fallout mm -hmm. being the uh the nuclear apocalypse and how can people uh survive after if people were able to survive a nuclear apocalypse, how would they rebuild society? What sort of laws would be brought into that? Um, yeah, there's just a lot of room to explore uh, future possibilities, you know, like um, how people would talk about the AI. You know, you have Terminator mm -hmm. that kind of shows how what will happen if, uh, you know, the iPhone takes over the world. Um they just kind of give more opportunities to remind us that maybe certain things we should stop doing while we're ahead or, you know, they have a second guessing uh, some certain important decisions that we might think are good now, 
but have serious ramifications in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how I think they can be used. And I'm sure some, I'm sure many other people can find even better ways of addressing it. Uh, yeah. But I mean, there's, there's safety in, in putting it in hypothetical mm. and being like, Hey, look at this completely different made up scenario that may sort of have basis in what's going on. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. And, oh, just to remember this game is fiction, <laughs> but not really <laughs> any semblance to, to yeah, people yeah. or events living or I dead mean, or yeah. you have, um, I mean, Hideo Kojima is always, um, the guy who makes Metal Gear Solid was always has a bad habit of predicting the future. Like he mm -hmm. just will throw on the, like in Metal Gear Solid 2, there's a 30 minute scene on a call and they're talking about technology and how it's overtaking our lives. And uh, suddenly we'll be no more than just uh, likes on the shelf. And, um, you know, we will base each other off of numbers and uh, nothing else. And that's how it will be. But like at the time, you're like, this is nonsense. This is just, <laughs> you know, he literally just spouted things on a page. And uh, then it's it, yeah, Facebook, just like how, Instagram, how the pretty much everything. <laughs> yeah, just a yeah. uh, scroll of entertainment, like nonstop. And that is something we are a part of. We do uh, create content for people to enjoy and be entertained instead of probably fixing the main issue. But we do what we can to um, make other people's lives just a, a little bit more enjoyable. Um, so yeah, there's plenty of um, geniuses in game de games development and film that uh, have ideas of how to insert and introduce these topics through video games. Okay. And have you ever played a video game that you felt had a positive impact on your mental health or well-being? Um, so definitely, um, yeah, I would say during COVID, I mean, there are many other occasions I could point out, but during COVID was definitely one of those situations where, you know, you lost your job, you had to move back with your family, uh, suddenly all these things you've been working for are no longer, uh, on the table. Uh, you have to rethink things from the drawing board and, it was just kind of an opportunity to be like, well, the world has stood still. I may as well stand still too. So I just mm -hmm. sat down, stopped playing new games that I felt I had to play and started going back to other games that I know I love. Um, because normally I'd be like chasing new experiences, mm -hmm. but then I was just like, you know what? Maybe I should just go back, play Final Fantasy XII, see if I can beat all the super bosses like I always wanted to as a kid. And I did, uh, and that was a great achievement. And then I went to Final Fantasy XIV, um, met loads of people online, went on this entire new journey that I'd already been through, but now I got to see it from an entirely different lens. Um, it, it almost felt like a ghost town when I was first playing, but now all of a sudden you cannot go into a room in Final Fantasy without it being packed full of people who are playing the game and people who are experiencing it for the first time. So you just kind of hop along the ride and try to make sure that they have a nice time too by giving out hot chocolate and uh, cookies. <laughs> um, just, I always kind of like tried making little moments memorable whenever I encountered somebody else that might be starting their journey. Because there were definitely times where like, when I started my journey um, that time, a random guy just came up to me and said, um, Oh, hey, is there a jacket or anything you'd want me to craft for you? Uh, do you have a favorite item in the game um, that you think looks cool and I can make it? And I was like, yeah, can I get the red or can I get that jacket, the rebel jacket that looks really Oh, yeah, cool? yeah, yeah. Uh, and he was like, oh, what color? And I was like, oh, uh, uh, red. And then he came back within seconds with one of my favorite outfits in the game ready for me on day one so i can t continue the game with that jacket on and that was a super memorable moment um and that was literally just somebody taking um a couple minutes out of their time to introduce themselves and try and make somebody else's experience um 
much better and certainly did so i hope i can i do that for other people as well um i really just want us all to have a good time beautiful and and so inspiring because that's the the kind of community we all wish we had in real life but due mm. to circumstances we we don't so yeah that is unfortunate um definitely as years go on and the more we get into social media and being behind the tv and we've just kind of adjusted to being a bit more afraid of mm -hmm. um talking and communicating with people and you know we also have reason to be because there are people out there that will you know scam you or do what they can with your information and um so it is hard to kind of trust but at the same time i feel like we have that initial thing inside us that wants to trust other people and wants to help people and you know games kind of let you do that in a safe space you know and mm -hmm. um, nobody's got a claw of the tv to attack me if i say <laughs> something wrong um so yeah it does there are give and takes to it but it's certainly a beautiful thing to be able to communicate with people from across the world just because you like the same thing and you have full access and ability to actually communicate with them. I think it's fantastic. I think it's amazing. I hope it can, continues on in the future. Absolutely wonderful, for sure. Uh, that's the end of my questions. Is there anything that I didn't ask that you wanted to uh, comment on at this point in time? Or? Honestly, I just want to thank you. I didn't think I could get the, uh, I didn't think you'd pick me up for an interview. And I had a fantastic time because as somebody who grew up with a lot of people that didn't play games or didn't play the same games uh, or wouldn't take it seriously. I had to spend years learning to hold back and not talk about games because, you know, to people who don't play games it might seem too daunting. They don't understand it. They get bored. Uh, and it's understandable because you're talking about all this nonsense that they just wouldn't understand unless they were there. Um, so it is really nice that I was able to kind of let loose for about two hours and just talk about things that I love. So thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate that. You are very welcome. Thank you so much for asking. I, I love chatting with members of the community and uh, it's just been a phenomenal couple of hours. So thank you so much. Uh, if anyone so much. wanted to check out more of your stuff, uh, where would you send them? So you can check out my YouTube channel at No Purpose Indie. Um, there you'll find 3D animations, new player experiences, and uh, comedy skits and shorts. And there's a lot more coming in the future. If you want to see behind the scenes um, footage on what I might be doing in workshops or 3D printing, uh, definitely check out my Instagram at No Purpose Indie. And yeah. Uh, you all enjoyed yourself as I did. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, I hope you have a fantastic evening. I know I've kept you up late, but uh, yeah. <laughs> it's not that late. <laughs> um, but yeah, you too, Debbie. Thank you so much. And uh, have a great evening. Okay. Bye, gamers.